Picture this. It is 2 a.m. in the morning. You're driving home from a long night out. All you want is to get home and crawl into your bed. And then you pull up to a red light. The streets are completely empty. Not a single car or a single person in sight. But you still stop, right? You are a responsible driver. <laughs> you sit there, waiting, your engine humming, waiting, and you think to yourself, who am I even waiting for? And here is the irony. The machine that stops you doesn't even know that you exist. <laughs> and that's when it hits you. The city doesn't adapt to us. We adapt to it. We live by its rhythms, its routines, its rules, even when they make no sense. You all had that moment, haven't you? You arrive at the bus stop just in time to watch your bus pulling away. You run and you wave and try to make eye contact with the driver, but the doors close anyways. Or those very hot summer days, it's 35 degrees outside, but you still carry a jumper with you because it's freezing cold in your office. We just accept it. These things seem small, but they point to something much bigger. The systems, the very systems that we have designed to serve us, to protect us, have somehow forgotten to include us. How did we end up here? About two centuries ago, something shifted. The Industrial Revolution didn't just change what we build. It also changed how we think. We fell hopelessly in love with efficiency, the kind that the machines promise. If you can control every single part individually, you can control the outcome. And that logic, after a while, began shaping everything that we built, including our cities. We started designing and organizing our cities, like an assembly line. Housing here, work over there, shopping somewhere else, and all connected by roads. Neat, efficient, predictable. And it all worked for a while. Like well-oiled machines on an urban scale. But here is the thing. If you design and build a city like a machine, it starts to act like one. Traffic lights will turn red when there's no one around. Sprinklers will keep watering the gardens, even when it starts raining outside. Air conditioners will keep us cool indoors while dumping all the air they generate back into the streets. So everything works, right, individually, but nothing works together. And slowly, without even realizing, we end up living in a system that doesn't even care. The same machine logic also shaped how we live. Think about it. We take things from nature on a daily basis, and we make things with them. And we call them products, like phones, clothes, cars. We use them for a while, and once we're done, we just toss them away. Because our system is built to replace. 
Did you know that out of every hundred things that we make, fewer than seven, yes, fewer than seven are ever reused, repaired or recycled. And the remaining 93 are burned or buried or sent to landfill, never to be accessed ever again. Imagine a bakery making hundreds of loaves of bread on a daily basis, every morning, and then you're throwing away 93 of them into the bin. Absurd, isn't it? Yet, that's exactly what's happening in our cities on a daily basis, multiplied by millions of people and businesses. Some of you might think, well, it can't be that bad. After all, cities only cover 3% of our planet. That is correct, only 3%. But the tiny 3% also consumes around 80% of the world's energy and is responsible for roughly 70% of global emissions. Well, that is a machine overheating. What if I told you that we can change all that? We can. Only if we designed how our cities work. Not following a machine logic, but something more like alive, like a living system. Where do you think we can look at for a better model to get our inspiration from? Well, nature figured it out, didn't it? In nature, there is no waste. Everything is connected. A fallen leaf becomes soil. Soil feeds the roots. Roots feed the trees. Trees give back fruit, shade and oxygen. Well, our bodies work the same way. We are a part of a living system, right? Our blood flows exactly where it's needed. If one of our organs struggle, our system is designed to sense it and tries to recover. Because that's exactly how life is kept in balance, through connection. Machines burn through everything you feed into them. Living systems return what they take. Machines isolate, living systems connect. Machines repeat, living systems evolve. What if our cities work like living systems? Imagine transport flowing through the city like blood, circulating smoothly and feeding every corner as and when needed as opposed to rushing all the blood to the feet at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. The heat from the local bakery, warming up the apartments above, the rainwater collected on one roof, watering the gardens next door. Or your neighbor's spare solar power cooking your dinner tonight. How would it feel to live in a city that gives back as much as it takes. And that's what I do. In my research, I explore, I study, how cities can behave less like machines and more like living systems. We call them circular cities, places where energy, water, materials, and care circulate in loops, Yesterday's waste becomes tomorrow's resource. And every single design for a circular city is shaped by two very simple questions. The first one is, how does it connect and contribute to life around it? And second, what does it become next, in its next life? This isn't just theory, it is already beginning to happen. 
in real cities across the globe, even here in Australia, in Fremantle's East Village. There is a neighborhood which is designed to generate and share solar power collectively, instead of every single house doing it on its own. So all the rooftops feed into one big community battery, and everybody in the neighborhood has access to cheaper and cleaner energy. In Paris, cafes no longer throw away their used coffee grounds. They are collected, and they are sent to local farmers. Local farmers grow mushrooms with them, and those mushrooms are then sent to local restaurants, where new recipes and food is created for the community. And that's exactly how waste turns into jobs, food, and connection. These are wonderful examples, aren't they? And there are many more, but they are still outliers, not the norm, for now. And quite honestly, we may not see fully circular cities in our lifetime. But here is the truth that we cannot ignore: the systems we live in create more waste than our planet can absorb. And demand more resources than our planet can regenerate. But right now, we have a choice. We can choose to redesign how our systems work, or, if we don't, nature will eventually make that choice for us through collapse. And designing for a circular future is not really a distant ideal; it is the responsibility of our lifetime. And quite frankly, it is the only choice that gives humanity a future worth imagining. Thank you.